going to talk about uh, image processing uh, with Big ML, and this is going to be a bit of a look into the future. This isn't stuff uh, that we've kind of released to the public yet and that all you guys can go on the public deploy and play with. This is stuff we're testing with beta customers right now, um, but very, very soon we're going to have a, a release of this stuff in the Big ML API, and um, soon after that, we'll release it in the interface so that so that people can play with it that way. Um, so as I said, uh, we're we're almost there. Um, we're like a little a little tiny turtle crawling on the beach, um, and we'll make it to the ocean eventually. Uh, follow our blog; that's where we talk about most of the stuff that we release on the platform. <clears throat> and uh, this is going to be a bit of a preview. Um, so uh, as a little uh, uh, caveat emptor, a little. Uh, uh, catch uh, here is that none of this is final. So what I'm saying right now about big ML uh, image processing, some of it might change in the future, <clears throat> in the very near future. So what am I going to talk about? Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about kind of an overarching philosophy of, of image processing as it has to do with machine learning. Um, then I'll go through with some types of feature extraction you can do, uh, you will be able to do with big ML image processing and just kind of methods of feature extracting for images in general. Um, and then I'll talk about a couple of issues kind of unique to image processing, or maybe maybe not unique, um, depending on the data that you have, uh, solutions to those issues. And then I'll, I'll close with a little warning slash pet peeve I have about the way uh, uh, computer vision problems are being talked about kind of in, in the world at large outside of machine learning right now. Um, so what is image processing? So everybody and their brother all know about convolutional neural networks at this point. And they're very powerful. They provide solutions to uh, uh, especially image classification, object detection, various vision problems. Uh, CNNs provide solutions that are way better than what we had in the past. And um, I'm kind of showing my age here, but computer vision you know, did exist before CNNs and it was fairly robust. And I myself worked in that area for about five years um, just before CNNs became very popular. So we were working on all of these problems, image classification, object detection, without CNNs for a long time. And we did have some degree of success. CNNs are better um, at all of these things, but uh, we weren't terrible at these things to begin with. Um, so what are convolutional neural networks doing that's really special? And the spoiler here is that it's not really um, all that special what convolutional neural networks do. Um, what they do is they extract features from images in the same way uh, that we have been designing algorithms, we, the vision community, have been designing algorithms to extract features by hand for years and years. They just do it uh, better and automatically. So they, convolutional neural networks, essentially design their own features that get extracted. Um, but finally, you see in the green box at the right of this image here, finally, you end up with a bunch of features and you basically classify with those features. So what you've got is, uh, in most cases, when you're doing image classification, um, you get these glorified feature extraction, extractors. <clears throat> and so the question is, um, in terms of image classification or you know, related problems where, where you use tabular data. Is that all that's going on here? And also do more traditional vision methods, the, the non-CNN non based vision techniques, do those still have a place uh, in the, the algorithmic repertoire? And I'm gonna argue that they do. <clears throat> um, you see here flashback number one, uh, this is from uh, the supervised, unsupervised talk, um, dealing with different types of data uh, is all about in machine learning, the quickest way to machine learning is to make your data tabular, right? So if you have non-tabular data, text, uh, date times, yes, images, um, all of those need to be reduced to vectors of features uh, in some way. <clears throat> and so in this, in this way, uh, images are not that special. All we have to do is somehow reduce this image to a vector of features, to a one-dimensional collection of numbers. Um, so the easiest way to do that, of course, is just to flatten the image. Uh, images are all pixels, right? They already are a collection of numbers. And so the easiest thing to do would just be to line those pixels up and now you have a vector of numbers. <clears throat> and this approach is not entirely without precedent. There's a lot of uh, algorithms that can work on the raw pixel values like this. The problem is, is that, uh, one of the problems is, is that it doesn't scale very well. Uh, so if you have a 256 by 256 image and it has three colors, uh, three color channels, then you line up all those pixels and you've got 200,000 features. 
uh, without even you know having a very large image. Um, Two hundred thousand features is you know it's it's a large data set. It's not completely unworkable, but it's larger than most data sets. So there's a lot of algorithms uh, that will choke on on something so wide, or or it will take forever to run on a data set that's two hundred thousand features wide. And moreover, uh, it ignores all of the structure between the features, right? So this is part of what's uh, a little bit special about images is that they have this unique structure. There's this unique relationship between the features. And not only that, but every image you see has this relationship uh, in which one of the features uh, is above or below or on top of another feature, right? The features have this spatial relationship with one another um, that isn't present in general in machine learning algorithms. <clears throat> and so uh, basically, CNNs, the reason that they're such good feature extractors is they exploit that relationship, that spatial relationship between the raw features in the image. Uh, and I'm not going to go into exactly what convolution is or how it works, but essentially it works on little windows of the image and it transforms the features in those little windows to things that are more semantically meaningful and, you know, does this iteratively. So uh, layers on top of layers will learn iteratively more complex uh, features. <clears throat> But finally, all, all it does is it, uh, it will reduce your image to tabular data. And then the nice thing about thinking about CNNs in that way is that once your image is reduced to tabular data, once you've got the image reduced to a nice set of features, to a nice uh, row per image, you can use any big ML algorithm on those features. So you might want to cluster images, and now you can do that with big ML's clustering. It, it happens automatically. Um, there's no, there, there's no, there's no more friction than that between you and clustering images. You just have to decide on how you're going to featureize those images. Um, similarly, we can do anomaly detection. Uh, we can uh, do any kind of classification. We can apply trees or logistic regression to these features. All the usual big ML algorithms reply, uh, apply as they would with any sort of numeric data. Okay, but that does gloss over. Uh, uh, quite a bit of literature uh, in in the academic world. Images are a little bit special. There's these there's these problems that are kind of unique to images, right? Uh, there's object detection, image segmentation, uh, problems like super resolution uh, that have to do with transforming one image into another. <clears throat> these problems, of course, we don't solve yet at Big ML because they're unique to images. Um, as we progress, you know, as we uh, expand our uh, uh, image processing capabilities will support maybe one or more of these other problems. Uh, we've already done, you know, object detection work for other customers uh, as a customized project. We're not going to, uh, as, as in our first image processing release that's coming up, we're not going to expose that functionality. But we have thought about this and we are going to support some of these other learning settings in the future. So on to image feature extraction. So I've been talking about CNNs as image feature extractors. Um, what other kinds of image feature extractors exist, right? I just mentioned previously that feature extraction uh, has been going on in the vision community for many years before CNNs existed. Um, and like any other algorithm, there's gonna, or like any ML setting, any ML algorithm, any ML processing technique, there's always this trade-off between something simple and fast or something complex and slow. And uh, the choice that you have here, what makes something simple or complex in the in the vision world is uh, what information you want to preserve. So really what you're thinking about here is, all right, I'm reducing this image to, you know, 100 numbers, or I'm reducing this image to uh, 1,000 numbers. And as I said, even the small images, 256 by 256 by 3, even small images have 100 times that many features, 1,000 times that many features. <clears throat> And so when you reduce uh, that 200,000 pixels uh, to 100 uh, values or 1,000 values, you're eliminating information, right? It's, it's compression. It's necessarily eliminating some information. And so um, the, the goal is to only eliminate information that you want eliminated, right? You want to preserve all of the information or as much information as possible that's useful to the problem you're trying to solve, uh, rather than you know eliminating information that you that that may be usable uh, for the problem that you're trying to solve. So, as as kind of the most basic example, 
uh, of feature extraction. Let's just thinking about think about scaling the image down to something uh, to some very small size. So let's scale the image down to say four by four. <clears throat> uh, if you have three channels per pixel, um, you're just averaging these pixels down to a four by four grid. Uh, you have three channels per pixel. Four by four is 16 pixels. Now you've got 48 features. So a very small number. You've eliminated tons of information, right? You, this image is no longer recognizable. Um, you're preserving some of the color information, a little bit of the global spatial information, some of the global detail, but it discards all of the local detail. So anything that's inside of those uh, four by four grids, any of the individual values have been averaged away. You have no idea what they were. <clears throat> and you could generalize this to say, okay, not only do I want the mean values of these uh, pixels, but I also want the variance inside of these super pixels. That's fine. That might give you a little extra information, but of course it increases the dimensionality of your problem here. It gives you way more features. So there's always there's always trade-offs. There's always different things you can do here. Um, the next thing, uh, again, something that's kind of common in the vision world is to do pixel histograms. So uh, you make for each channel, red, green, and blue, you make 16 bins, and then you start counting pixels into those bins, depending on uh, the value of the color of that pixel. So you see in this image here, uh, the green channel um, is fairly low. The, the, the values for the green pixels in general, um, there's not much green in the image. On the other hand, there's quite a bit of red in the image, right? The red values are very high. <clears throat> um, and so this again, uh, represents this trade-off, right? Now you've got the color information at a fairly high level of detail. I can I can tell you about the color of this image um, in 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 kind of a in in kind of a nice way, in a general way, um, but pretty specifically. Uh, but also uh, you've discarded all of the spatial information, right? So if spatial information is important to your problem. Uh, then you don't have it if you featureize your your image in this way. Now let's get into something a little fancier. These are these are some of the features that we actually used to use in the vision community more uh, before we had CNNs to rely on. So uh, this is called histogram gradients or histogram of or oriented gradients or hog features, uh, they, they call them sometimes. And basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna look at each pixel and you're gonna compute the relative intensities of the pixels above and below to the left and to the right. Um, so in that way, you get kind of a horizontal vector of how fast the the uh, image is changing uh, intensity, and also you get a vertical vector of how fast the image is changing intensity. So if it's going, if you can imagine, if an image is going from white to black in the vertical direction, and it's staying about the same color in the horizontal direction, then you've got an edge that's running in the horizontal direction, right? It's changing color in the vertical direction, so you've got an edge that's running through perpendicular to that. <clears throat> uh, and you can actually, if you've got kind of a combination of intensity of intensities in the horizontal and vertical direction, you can use basic trigonometry to kind of decide what angle the edge is probably at. And then using these angles that you have, now you have intensities and angles for every pixel. Now you can bin those and you can get an idea for like a, a, a five by five grid of pixels in the image. You can get an idea of which way the edges are pointing generally in that grid. And this turns out to be really informative. Uh, if you take a histogram of, of kind of cells over the entire image, you can get an idea of, okay, relative to, uh, relative to this, in this part of the image, I've got edges going this way. In this part of the image, I've got edges going this way. Um, and you can start to recognize uh, objects at a rudimentary level using these edges at different points in the image. So this, uh, you see in this example here, um, it's a person we're trying to recognize. And you can imagine how that happens, right? If you see a vertical edge in a certain place in the image and a horizontal edge in a different other place in the image, you can kind of say, okay, this is probably uh, a person, you know, if they're upright, if they're facing you, um, you get the edges that you're, that, you're bound to, that you're bound to get if you're seeing an image of a person. And this is in fact, historically, what histograms of gradients were used for <clears throat> is detecting people in images. That was one of the main marquee applications of, of hog features. Um, and so what do we have here? We have something that's pretty good at preserving global shape information. And in fact, if you try to reconstruct an image from a histogram of gradients, uh, you can do a pretty good job. Like you get, you get of course, a black and white image because you're only looking at image uh, intensity gradients. 
uh, from, from one part of the image to the other. But you can see all the edges. And when you can see all the edges of an image, then you basically know what's in it, right? You're basically seeing a line drawing of whatever was in it. And so you're, you're preserving global shape information, but you're discarding any of the local detail. Uh, so, you know, if there were if there were small edges within those little grid cells, those are averaged away. Um, and you're also discarding all of the color information. And then uh, uh, finally, there's also wavelet decomposition. <clears throat> um, so wavelet decomposition uh, is sort of, uh, in a way, it's sort of the opposite of, uh, of gradient decomposition, even though they're both kind of gradient-based techniques. Um, Wavelet decomposition essentially looks for the, the local gradients. It's trying to find how much local detail you have at each level. So the basic idea here is we're gonna run a high pass filter on the whole image. So basically find the edges on the whole image. Then we're gonna average however many edges we find. So if we find a ton of, of action, essentially a ton of edges at this, uh, at this level of decomposition, we'll have a high average value. If there are no edges, we'll have a low average value. And then we're going to reduce the image by a factor of two. So we scale it down and we do this again. Find the edges, scale it down, find the edges and scale it down until you get to a very small image that's, you know, only a few pixels by a few pixels. And there's there's not really many edges left to find. Um, and the idea here is that everything in the image uh, happens at, at some specific frequency. So this is a frequency domain. Uh, it's half frequency domain analysis here where you're imagining, okay, there are some things that happen, uh, some things that have a lot of edges that are, that are very close together, some things that have um, edges that are very far apart, and I can use these features to kind of disambiguate those two things. Uh, so what this turns out to be really good at is uh, thing problems where texture is very important. <clears throat> so you can imagine uh, like a picture of a fence close up versus a picture of a brick wall close up, um, the brick wall is going to have very different edge characteristics than the fence, right? The fence might only have vertical edges. Um, they might be kind of soft vertical edges, whereas uh, brick itself has its own little texture um, that represents a bunch of little tiny edges in a bunch of different directions uh, uh, on the on the brick. And so when you're when you're looking at things, you know, are the edges very tight and close together? Or are the edges kind of regular and spaced apart? Um, this is this is a technique that helps you kind of determine those things, kind of the, uh, using the the very local edge information uh, at different at different frequencies, so at different spatial uh, different spatial separations. And where I've used this in the past is um, I've uh, I've actually written an academic paper where a gentleman came to me. Um, he was an art conservator. He had a whole bunch of very close-up images of paper, uh, microscopic images. And when you looked at these images, you could see uh, by the micro by the microscopic image, you could see what the texture. Uh, uh, you could see a different kind of texture map. It would look like white noise, or it would look like regular circles, or a grid, or something like this. But you could tell what kind of paper you were looking at when you had these microscopic images. And he would use this to detect forgery. So basically, if you had a very old photo, you would expect the paper to be of one type or another. Um, and if it was a forgery, it would often be printed on modern paper. And even if you couldn't spot the difference with your eyes, if you had a microscope, you could spot the difference <clears throat> using this texture information in the paper. And so because he had like 4,000 photographic papers, he wanted to know when he, when he had a microscopic image, which sort of paper this was, uh, you could take an image of this and you could look through all of your papers and find ones with similar uh, wavelet decompositions. And you could say this, this paper looks like this collection of you know, 10 or 12 papers. So you've got something that preserves the texture information uh, at a coarse level in a way that the gradient decomposition does not, the histogram of gradients uh, does not, <clears throat> but it mostly ignores this global detail. So you don't get global shape information in the way you do uh, with the histogram of gradient features. And then finally, uh, as I said, we can use pre-trained CNNs as featureizers, right? You look at uh, you look at the final pooling operation, everything that happens uh, after that, you basically just slop, uh, uh, cut off those layers and you can use uh, the, la the final pooling operation as the features uh, for your classifier. Uh, so you see the, that's the ResNet architecture there on the right. Um, so this is a kind of a popular CNN uh, that you can pre-train on ImageNet, which is a huge collection 
of natural images, um, about a million natural images. And <clears throat> at the very end there, uh, that's the information that we kind of get rid of uh, when we use these pre-trained CNNs for featureizers. So you can see all of the information, all of the layers before that, which is quite a lot of you know, parameters, quite a lot of, of of logic that goes into those layers, we're preserving all of that information. So the vast majority of information that goes into the classification of, of these ImageNet images is preserved. <clears throat> and so what do you get when you use these as featureizers? You, you generally get a whole bunch of really useful things, like um, whether or not there's an eye in the image or whether or not there's like fur or stripes in the image, things that help you classify natural images. Unfortunately, if your image, if the image that you're using doesn't have any of these things that you see in kind of a broad collection of photographic natural images, then you're kind of out of luck. These features don't give you the things you need to properly classify your image. So a good example here is if you're just trying to classify documents or handwritten digits or something like that, um, these features aren't going to be great because they don't look for the things that are interesting in your particular image. If you're looking at a document, the odds that you're going to see eyes or fur or, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of other things, baseballs that you can see in some of these CNN features, uh, those just don't happen in your documents. And so they aren't super useful features in the case that you don't have natural images, uh, images that you might take with your mobile phone, for example. Okay, so now, uh, we're sort of in the place where we are with supervised learning, where we have all these choices, and how do we know what the best thing is? <clears throat> and the way to think about this is that you should think about what your features are causing the classifier to see. So this is uh, where it's rather easier than thinking about supervised learning, because you can imagine what the classifier is seeing if you do a little bit of intellectual work. Um, you might also want to take the speed of extraction into account, so those things that I just went through, um, are kind of listed from uh, faster to slower and simple to complex. Uh, so if you need something fast, which we'll talk a little bit about more later, uh, you might want to take that into account. Um, lots of vision problems are maybe simpler than you think. Uh, so for example, if you're just looking to see whether an image has text or not, uh, that, that's, that's a comparatively simple problem, depending on your domain. If you're looking, uh, you know, you're looking at images that might be blank, blank paper or they might be a paper with a piece of paper with a lot of text on them. Um, if this is what you're doing, then you can make a classifier with fairly simple features that will that will do that for you. <clears throat> um, but the impact of choosing the right features in image processing is gigantic. Uh, I, I often like to think that the old adage that features feature engineering is the most important thing in machine learning uh, comes specifically from people working on vision problems. Because in vision, uh, choosing the right features is really, really important. And here's just a couple examples of why that is. So let's let's say you've got an anomaly detector, right? And you want to know which of these images is anomalous. So which which set of in 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 which set of features is this is the correct image going to be anomalous? Um, so if you look at these for a couple of seconds and think about this problem, I'll give you one or two seconds to think about this. And so the third uh, image from the left, the one with the, the inner square that happens uh, on the left of the image, uh, is, is probably the anomalous image here, right? If you had to guess, uh, all of the other images have the red square on the right side. The third image from the left has the red square on the left side. Um, okay, so what features could detect an anomaly like that, where a major, uh, unimportant, feature of the image is like on the wrong side of the image or you've got an image uh, that's that's uh, a mirror um, that where the anomaly is like a mirror of the usual images. <clears throat> well, what features are you going to get from the tiny image extractor? You're going to get uh, this, this four by four grid of pixels and it's going to basically tell you the information that you need, right? It's going to tell you, oh, there's red on this side of the image in, in most of the images and in the anomalous images, there's red on the other side. Um, you get that from a four by four reduction of the image. So that's that would be a useful set of features for this problem. The, the tiny image, the, the, the small four by four image would be able to tell you which images, uh, which of the images are anomalous. Now, what about if you do color histograms? If you do color histograms, <coughs> all of these images are exactly identical. 
Um, and that's by design. Like I made these, made sure that these red squares and all these images were exactly the same size, which means that you're going to get identical histograms for all of them. So if you choose the color histogram uh, extractor, all of these images are identical. The problem is impossible. None of the images are anomalous at all. <clears throat> and so now here's, a, here's another case, which of these images is anomalous? This is a bit easier, right? The first three are shades of green. Uh, the last one is red. And so that red image for, for us humans, would, you'd say immediately, oh, that's the weird one. Um, now what features are you gonna get from the color histogram extractor? Uh, you're going to get the exact right features you need, right? Color is the axis on which this, this image is weird. And so you've, <coughs> excuse me, uh, color is the image on which, is the axis on which these images uh, are, are strange or not. And so if you've got a color histogram, you'll be able to tell the difference between the strange images, the red images, and the green images, which are the not strange images, right? Uh, now, what about from the gradient histogram extractor? What kinds of features are you gonna get? You're going to get uniform features, right? There's no edges in the image. And so you're gonna get either all zeros or you're gonna get all the same value in any case for every feature because there aren't any edges running through the image. <clears throat> and so again, with the gradient histogram extractor, you're going to get uh, features that are identical for all of these images. The problem becomes impossible. None of these images are anomalous under the gradient histogram extractor. So what's the best thing here? Um, and the best thing, the gap between the best thing is just gigantic. So when we were talking about supervised learning algorithms, uh, the difference between ensembles and deep nets, for example, is usually small. For most problems, um, the, the data geometry doesn't like dramatically prefer uh, deep nets to ensembles. There, there's not, there's, there, there are a few cases where their performance is really, really dramatically different. That's the, that's the odd case, that's the exception. Um, in this case, uh, it seems to be the rule, right? If you choose the right features, the problem becomes completely trivial, like in the color, the color histogram case for the colored images or the, the tiny image case for uh, the images with the square moving around. If you choose the right features, uh, at the, you can find the anomalies ready, readily. It's no problem. Uh, if you choose the wrong features, not only do you get something that performs badly, but you get something where the problem is impossible. You, you completely ruin your chances of solving the problem. <clears throat> so that's, uh, there's something unfortunate about that, right? Uh, uh, you, can, you can completely scuttle your ability to make a vision model if you choose the wrong features. Um, and CNNs have gained traction in part because they make it so that you don't have to think about this anymore. You just train the CNN and it picks the right features for you. You don't have to do any more of this feature engineering. But if you can, if you're able to kind of decide, okay, anomalies in my domain are color-based or anomalies in my domain are spatial or uh, my, uh, anomalies in my domain are texture-based. If you can kind of decide that about your images uh, in general, if you can decide what your computer needs to see to be able to solve this problem, um, there's a lot of problems you can solve with a lot less data and a lot less computing power. <clears throat> and this is kind of what we're all about at Big ML, right? We wanna give you uh, the tools you need to solve the problem that you have rather than just saying, you know, plow, plow all of my images into this thing. Maybe CNNs will work, maybe they won't, but that's, that's really all we're offering. Um, okay, but so, so I've kind of uh, badmouthed CNNs a little bit in a sense, but of course, as I said at the, at the top, there's some problems for which they're just the best thing. They're, they're way better than anything else. And so we, we are gonna offer this at Big ML. If you train a deep net, um, with image data, we'll learn a full CNN for you. And we'll do this by um, trying uh, a, a bunch of the common topologies like uh, ResNet topologies, simple topologies, some of the, the mobile net topologies, and we'll just give you what works best for your data. We're probably not gonna allow a ton of configuration uh, for CNNs in Big ML if you, you, know, if you really wanna explore the, the, the various um, knobs you can turn in CNN and there are hundreds of them, um, you, you usually do that with like a proper deep learning framework. But here you'll be able to avail yourself of the usual deep learning and we will do a little exploration for you in the deep learning space as we do with deep nets on non-image data. 
Um, the thing you have to be aware here, aware of here, though, is that CNNs they typically take orders of magnitude more data to train than if you just pick really good features. So if one of your, if one of the feature types that I was talking about before, if one of those things works for your problem, and you pick the right one, <clears throat> then you don't need CNNs, and also you save a ton of time, and you can train it with less data. Uh, so now, um, just going through a couple of applications here. Um, a lot of the, the, when we did kind of the market analysis for this, a lot of software as a service ML providers are focusing on the basic functionality where you have an image, uh, you want to label that image. <clears throat> and so that's, that's the whole data pipeline is basically you get an image in, uh, you, you, it has a label, and then you try to learn a CNN that maps the image to the label. Um, this is good and fine, and there's a lot of use cases that are just like this, where you, all you want to do is apply a label to an image. <clears throat> but there's a lot of real-world problems that are more complex than this, because first of all, you might not just have an image that you want to label. You want to label an instance, right? And an instance might be more than one image. An instance might be an image associated with some numbers or some text. And so this is why we kind of wanted to treat images holistically in the platform is because you want you may want to bring other data to the classification problem. And in fact, the, the, the guess is, is that in the real world, you eventually will. You eventually will want to bring other informative data to a classification problem instead of just using the images by themselves. <clears throat> and then uh, also more real world problems are complex because you don't have the compute power to throw a CNN at everything you see. The most complex CNNs, um, they really need GPUs to run in anything like reasonable time. Uh, so if you if you don't have a device with a GPU, even the small CNNs are too much for an edge computing device. Um, you might want to avail yourself of some of these other uh, simpler features uh, and simpler modeling on top of them. Uh, so here's application number one. This is kind of one of the motivating applications that I think of um, when when I think of the way Big ML has is developing its image processing. Let's suppose you uh, you're developing an app for a car insurance company, and you want to make it so that they can take a picture, and you want an automated system to look at the picture of the damage after a car accident, and estimate the severity of the claim. Maybe to do claim routing, or maybe to do some sort of triage process, or uh, uh, any number of reasons, you might want to know how much this claim is likely to be immediately. <clears throat> so this is a simple regression problem, right? You have an image, you have a dollar amount, uh, a label, the severity of the claim, and you just want to map the image to the dollar amount. You get a bunch of data, and you can you can learn this with no problem. But now, uh, let's suppose you have two images, right? Let's suppose you want uh, the person to take a front image of the damage and a side image of the damage. Uh, let's also suppose maybe we have telemetry data from the car. Uh, Allstate, the insurance company, is offering these little drive-wise devices that allows you to plug uh, a little device into the car and it gathers telemetry data from the car, like whether or not you're pushing the brakes and how fast you're going, et cetera, et cetera. And so what if you, what if you have that data from this little device? Um, that's probably, that probably will inform your uh, your even even if the picture is is poor or doesn't show a lot of damage, that might inform um, what you think about the severity of the accident. Maybe if you knew they were going 70 miles an hour and you knew they weren't pressing the brake, even if the damage, even if they took kind of a flattering picture of the damage, <coughs> uh, it might be worse than you think if they were going so fast. So having this data might influence uh, your prediction. And so uh, with Big ML, again, uh, if we view these images as just features that we can just slap on top of one another, this becomes just as easy, right? You have two images, you have two numeric features, uh, you can just learn regression, uh, do regression in the same way. And let's keep going, right? What if you have the text of the police report? What if the, what if the police uh, report says there were injuries in the accident? What if the police report says there were no injuries and everybody drove away? Um, that's going to impact what you thought, what you think about the severity of the accident. Um, what if you have data from the user's mobile phone? Maybe you have accelerometer data. Maybe you have the geolocation data. Uh, maybe you know whether or not they were playing with their phone at the time. This might impact uh, how much you think the claim is going to be for. Maybe you can, maybe you can have some idea uh, right up front about whether or not there's going to be a lawsuit associated with this car accident. <clears throat> so all sorts of things you can do with this data 
when you kind of combine everything together and look at it holistically. And you can't do that <clears throat> when you have just uh, when when you're just kind of stuck in this single image to label uh, learning paradigm. Uh, if you view kind of images as just another collection of features, as we view text documents or as we view date times, um, then it becomes easy to kind of compose everything and get a model that takes all this information into account in one sense or another. Um, and then uh, the other application I want to talk about just as, as an example of when simple features can be better than complex ones, uh, we have this radarless radar gun. And this is something that one of our staff members wrote a blog about a couple of years ago. Um, and it was a really interesting little use case, especially given how fast it came together. Uh, so the, the use case is you're interested, you're looking outside your house, you're interested in the average speed of cars that are going by. Um, so basically what, what uh, Adam did is pointed window for a while uh, just out his second story window <clears throat> and he trained anomaly detectors on the road in front of him uh, and so the road usually looks like the road usually does right um, there are variances in lighting there's uh, you know some every once in a while uh, 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 there might be a shadow of something in the road but mostly the road just looks like the road it looks the same all the time or, or nearly the same all the time uh, modulo lighting conditions. <clears throat> and so you can easily train uh, anomaly detectors on tiles of this image. And then when a car drives through those tiles, what's going to happen? Some of those tiles are, gonna, are going to go off, right? The anomaly detectors are going to fire. And you're going to say, oh, something is in that window that's not the road. It's, uh, it's probably a car because I'm looking at the road and that's usually the only other thing that's there. Um, when, a group of, when a big enough group of tiles goes off, you probably got a car and then you can track the cluster of anomalies uh, through the image and you can estimate the speed of the car. This isn't very hard. Um, this all comes together with big ML in, in not too many lines of code and you can go to the blog and see more technical details about it. So this is a cool little image, uh, a cool little application, right? And the features he used here are actually a one by one reduction of each tile. So all he did was he took the mean color values, the mean RGB values, from each tile and that was the input to the feature detector. Um, so really, really simple features. And as a consequence, uh, prediction uh, prediction for this problem uh, runs really fast. And this is nice because you have to do it kind of at video speeds, right? You have to do it many times a second. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about that uh, more shortly. <clears throat> um, but suppose you wanted to reduce false positives here by checking uh, if the clump of, of uh, anomaly detectors was actually a car. Uh, so what you would do here is you would, every time your anomaly detectors fire, you would use that to crop part of the image, and then you would label some few dozen of these, maybe a few hundred of these as cars or not cars. Um, you would get an idea of uh, the other things that would cause your detectors to fire uh, other than cars, and you would just train a classifier to tell the difference between them. Is this a car? Is this not a car? Um, you'd use different features, of course. There's not it's not obvious that you're going to be able to average the pixel pixel values anymore uh, in a one, you know, average them down to to uh, to a one by one image <clears throat> and be able to tell whether or not it's a car. You'll probably need something like the gradient features. Um, but you but to solve this problem, the point here is, is that you don't need CNN style object detection like RetinaNet or YOLO if you're familiar with those with those terms. We can hack together CNN style object detection uh, using anomaly detectors on one by one images. And then uh, if, if those anomaly detectors fire, we do a classification uh, on the, uh, we do a, a more fancy classification on the image uh, that made the anomaly detectors fire. Um, so you don't need CNN style object detection, which is good because those models are really expensive to run compared to this. Uh, this goes, uh, unbelievably fast, um, you know, orders of magnitude faster than CNN, and so you can keep up with uh, video uh, even even without um, too much computing horsepower, no GPUs or anything like that. <coughs> okay, um, so this gets into this gets into uh, the the two problems that I wanted to talk about that are kind of unique to image processing. So the first one um, is speed. So uh, images go by at video speed 
And so when you want to deploy a CNN, you, often the first thing you ask is, okay, I want to run this on every frame of a video that's going by so I can analyze every single frame of a video. Um, sometimes that's a tough lift, right? If you don't have uh, a lot of computing horsepower, you're on an edge device, a mobile phone, uh, a camera with, with limited computing power, and you want to do those predictions on device, um, you, you're going to have you're going to have to do some work to make a lot of full CNNs run on those devices. In some cases, it won't be possible. Um, and so what can you do uh, with uh, a viewpoint like Big ML is taking uh, image, image classification wise to kind of help you with this? <clears throat> and one thing you can do is this model cascade. So this is sort of what I was talking about uh, in, in Adam's case, in the, in the blog case where you were looking for a car on the road. You train these anomaly detectors. You train a very simple model that has a, a very low false negative rate. It has near perfect recall, but it has poor precision. So he's got these very simple anomaly detectors. They'll fire for anything, right? They'll fire if a kid walks through the frame. They'll fire if a piece of uh, debris blows through the detector. They'll always fire, but they'll also always fire when there's a car driving through the frame. Um, so this is good, right? Uh, because it allows us to reject maybe 99% of frames. You know when there's nothing in the frame. The anomaly detectors tell you that uh, with extremely high accuracy. They tell you whether there's nothing in the frame. <clears throat> and so you're able to reject most of those predictions and save all of that computing power that you would normally use to do a more fancy classification. Um, for the 1% of images that make it through, you've got a slightly more complex model, do slightly more feature extraction. Uh, and then maybe you're able to reject a whole bunch of other models. Like maybe you say, okay, a car has to have basically this shape. Um, and so you only look for things that are basically that shape in, in one, using one set of features or another. And then if they pass that test too, then you go on to the final full CNN classification where you actually look to see if it's a car uh, with a, a neural network. Um, but by the time you get there, we're only talking about you know one video in a thousand that has to go, or one video frame in a thousand or 10,000 that has to go through that full classification. Finally, uh, you save a ton of computing power with these simple models that are able to reject most of the cases uh, that you that you don't want to that you don't want to uh, that are negative. And this isn't just for vision. Like if you uh, there's there's lots of cases um, where you you know you're uh, <clears throat> you're in the market, say in the stock market, you don't trade very often. You want a simple model that can operate uh, very quickly to reject all of the places where you definitely don't want to make a trade. Because um, that's most places, right? Most of the time you're not trading. You're only making a trade once in, in a very, you know, not uh, it, comparatively, you're making a trade very, very little of the time. And so if you have a simple model that's able to reject most times, you can move faster um, saving your compute power for the times where you actually might want to make a trade. And this might this comes up over and over again. Um, problem number two, lack of data. So the other, the other problem that's kind of unique to images is it can be hard to get and label all of this data. And you start to worry, once you start to collect this data, you start to worry about the variability in the data, uh, especially variability that just isn't a problem for humans. <clears throat> So we think about stuff like image noise, if there's like some fuzz over the edge or or like it's snowing or it's a little bit blurry, um, lighting conditions are different. All of these things might make image classifiers freak out in a way that uh, humans would have no problem with. And you'd like to make your classifier robust to these situations. This is something you'd like to do with data in general, um, but in images, you can do it without too many problems. Um, Images are nice because it's really easy to kind of simulate these situations that you're talking about. So, for example, um, you can take a picture, you can crop a little bit out, change the brightness, add a little bit of noise, um, and it's still going to be the thing that that it is that it was to begin with. And this is going to be recognizable to any human. So you can see how you can multiply your data set in this way, right? You can take your whole data set of 100 images, um, you can decrease the brightness by 1%, 5%, 10%. Uh, increase the uh, decrease the brightness, increase the brightness, crop a little bit out of each image, um, add a little bit of noise to each image, add more noise to each image. Uh, suddenly you've got thousands of images, right? They're all the same initial collection, of course, but now you're able to develop a classifier that's more robust to these kind of minor changes in image quality. 
um, it's not as good as having like actually having thousands of images, but it's much better than having just those hundred uh, with no augmentation uh, done to the data. Um, and then when you start thinking this way, you might be surprised that there uh, are some other opportunities for this. Um, so if you have data that's amenable to this, it might be a good idea to try and see what kind of uh, results come out. If you have data where you can say, okay, you know, I can change these features, or if I swap these features, the results should be the same. You can multiply the number of things in your data and robustify the classifier to, to changes that um, in general wouldn't phase a human. Okay, the very last thing I'm gonna talk about here, um, this is kind of switching gears, but adversarial attacks. So every once in a while in the news, um, you'll see something like, oh, if we have an image and we add some noise or we, we fiddle with the image a little bit or somebody comes with a, a poster board that has a certain shape or a certain uh, graphic uh, painted on it, <clears throat> you end up uh, being able to dramatically influence the prediction of the classifier. Um, so uh, this is this is kind of misrepresented in the news because this is always a problem, even in non-CNN models and even in non-machine learning models. If you think you're in a situation where you have an adversary trying to change the predictions, all models are susceptible to this. And especially machine learning models are susceptible to this, not just vision models. So this is a, a little pet peeve of mine. Uh, I think the, the popular media kind of understates uh, the problem of adversarial attacks on models. Um, you're, you're always vulnerable to adversarial attacks. So you have to think about layers of security around that if you're in a situation where people might want to attack the model. <clears throat> and ML itself can sometimes play a role here. So uh, if you use anomaly detectors, if you kind of measure the distributions of certain features that you're getting out, you can often uh, see these things and, oh, somebody's messed with this. Um, this is a weird thing that I haven't seen in my training data. You're able to detect these things in advance and, uh, and maybe mitigate some of the damage here. Okay, uh, summary, summing up. Uh, image feature extraction comes in a lot of flavors, but even CNNs, the, the fanciest things we can do in image, are still basically feature extractors, modulo those image specific problems that I was uh, that I mentioned before. <clears throat> Choosing the right features for image representation is even more crucial here than it is usually. So you can really make or break uh, your ability to solve a problem based on the image, the way you choose to reduce that image to a feature vector. And then finally, allowing image features and models to be composed gives you a little bit of flexibility to attack problems in different ways. So you don't just plow all your data into a CNN. You might learn, learn a cascade of classifiers. You might choose simpler features or more complex ones depending on your problem. Um, and so hopefully in BigML, we'll be able to give you all that flexibility and you'll be able to use it to, uh, to your advantage. All right, thank you very much.